Okay, we're good. We're good. We're good. Okay, so I'm going to talk just for about 10 minutes about um, some of the issues that have come up. Um, this is a summary of the of the two days, and it's been a fabulous two days, and it's been great to be together, and certainly yesterday face-to-face has been remarkable to be able to catch up with people, but of course today has been important as well. Um, so it's been a great two days. So as I said before, I, I do apologise if I miss anything out. And of course, other people might have thought other things were important as well. But these are just some impressions which I and some of the key correspondent team have had during the two days. So what I'm going to talk about basically what we've done um, and some of the themes that have been coming up for us. These don't necessarily track the main themes of the conference, but these are just themes that have emerged over the two days, which for this presentation might be useful just to consider. So learning from COVID-19, the issue about resilience, the issue around inclusion and participation, and solutions dealing with the present and preparing for the future and then closing with some take-home messages which we believe are important but of course others might think others are important but this is simply a way of trying to get some overarching view of what's happened over the last two days so what have we done we've been having uh preparatory meetings for students i did a training with the students um two days ago which seems a long time but it was only two days but also there were other meetings that evening for students as well so this conference historically, but also this time particularly, has always had a big focus on empowering students to be involved in planning, uh, presenting and participating in different ways, which I think has been a very strong feature of the conference uh, whenever it's run. So that's really good to see. We've had plenaries and presentation, uh, plenaries and parallel sessions face to face and online. We've had lots of discussions and networking, lots of it. We had a book launch, Sally Hayden's remarkable book that she talked about um, uh, last night. Uh, we had some information about Women in Global Health Ireland. We had the Lancet Countdown launch of the 2022 report. We had this afternoon's workshop on gender equality for global health. And we've just enjoyed being together again. And it's been a fabulous opportunity to be together, sharing this space. And I personally find it very energising, and I hope you all have as well, because I think these kind of events are so important. And I think I wanted to pick out one quote. Uh, from one person speaking on the first day, which was, uh, it was fabulous to be all here in person after many years. Love the multidisciplinary mix. It's much better way. It's a much better way of finding solutions and thinking about solutions. And the global health crowd are really nice. And you know, yeah, obviously. So you know, that's fine. And that's really nice <laughs> to have a quote for summarising what uh, what it feels like to be together again. So. Um, the first thing, the first kind of theme that's been emerging and kind of it's been threading throughout all the presentations really is learning from COVID-19. And this has been a wake up call. It's impacted on all of us as individuals, our health systems, the people we work with, our interactions with systems and services. And now, of course, we're dealing with the aftermath. And for Colm Henry, who was talking yesterday, as the pandemic subsided, there was also a debt to be paid. And now we're seeing some of the long term impacts of COVID-19 on everybody, on systems, on institutions, on people. Um, and there are lots of issues that are now emerging that we didn't really expect during the pandemic because we were so key on, we were so focused on trying to prevent contagion. So I think that's something which is going to keep popping up, I think, on a fairly regular basis for quite a while. But it's also exposed existing inequalities. And as Mike Ryan said, most of the mortality of COVID-19 was a result of 30 years of injustice. The death toll of COVID-19 was baked into our system. And I think... We've had discussions these last two days which confirmed that and also confirmed what the global health community has been talking for a long time, which is there are inequalities which expose many people to increased risk of disease, non-communicable and communicable. And it's something we obviously need to continue our focus on. And it's not over. The shocks are still coming fast and furious. There are a lot of challenges remaining, uh, according to Marie Hallisey uh, from Goal. But also lessons have been learned. And I think this is also something which has been strong throughout the two days. Doing a search for lessons in my two days of notes. It emerges quite a lot, not just about COVID-19, but lessons being learned and taking them on to the next things we do. So we know about the real importance of interconnectedness. And I still think we've underestimated how difficult it was not to meet together, not just this conference, although that's obviously one of the things, but we did miss that personal connection, which COVID-19 and controlling the infection, uh, it was required for us to stay apart. And I think that's an issue which is still really emerging as something that might have a long tail and might keep impacting on people's uh, mental health, perhaps. We do need to get sustainable information to people, uh, not the same material for everyone. And that's another theme that's been popping up all the way through. 
this one size doesn't fit all and ensure support for those who communicate differently for example people who are hard of hearing and that was something that Pamela Toledo talked very passionately about yesterday we know there is better awareness of infection control and wash which is good but we also know that lockdown or quarantine advice can be meaningless or harmful for many people if their context doesn't allow that kind of freedom um for example how do you tell somebody to isolate if they don't have a home or have seven in a room or don't speak the same language according to Priscilla Lynch who was speaking yesterday chairing other sessions we do not in time of crisis trust in personnel facility care and messaging is so important we knew this in the global health community but what COVID-19 has been doing I think it's been uh, uh, it's been an example it, it, like one huge research study to show some of the issues that we knew existed in global health and now we saw them in real life and I think that's been uh, uh, it's been in a challenging experience for many people seeing things that we knew existed actually happening not just in countries far away but also in countries that are seen to be high income and with stable infrastructures and that last quote was from Neve Caffrey uh, speaking from Misty Ankara so we do need to prepare for the next pandemic and one way is health and community resilience so resilience also occurred many times during the two days clearly it was in the title of the uh, one of the key titles of the um, themes of the conference as Siobhan Walsh from Goal, inequalities are clear and visible to us all. The answers aren't easy. We have to look at health resilience across multiple levels. And communities and healthcare workers can be incredibly resilient. I did some research on uh, community responses to problems for pe people living with HIV, accessing treatments and services. And the community response has been fantastic, but this isn't without cost. So we must strengthen resilience for the future, not rely on short term solutions now. And Margaret Fitzgerald said that even when there isn't an outbreak, we should prepare. And this is a message, again, those of you in global health have been pushing for a long time. We've now seen a big example. And in a sense, we can use that to force decision makers to actually start getting ready for what comes next after COVID-19. Health resilience also includes mental health, which has been talked about much more now, which is really good, especially providing support for healthcare workers who've been uh, very threatened around their mental health because of COVID-19. Um, but it's still massively underfunded. Mental health is always the Cinderella. It's always the, the, the area that's most likely to be defunded if there is any shortage of cash. And it's something we need to fight for maintaining and increasing. And also an additional point, which struck me as interesting from Julian Eaton yesterday from CBM said that we mustn't start diagnosing people worrying about their future as having mental health problems because anxiety is now becoming well more of the norm than it ever has I mean it's always been there but it's now becoming more of the norm and I think something Mike Ryan said this morning struck me as well we one of our aims should be not to terrify our children or grandchildren into the fact they may be growing up into a dystopian future with lots of horrible things happening clearly they're going to be challenging the future but part of our role is to help them be prepared so they themselves can be resilient as they grow up and start dealing with the issues down the line we do need trust to build the resilience of communities if we're going to build resilience we can only do it together according to one participant but also there was an interesting discussion in one session I was in about changing the language which I think has started but should it be more widespread capacity building being replaced by resilience building because I've been working in global health for on and off in different areas for 20 years now and capacity building kind of peaked in 2010 and keeps getting rolled out but now it's become slightly meaningless because it's always one of these things like a tick box but resilience building has a very uh is very current and maybe it's something we should be pushing more of in the language we use of how to prepare communities and build communities um, to face the challenges they face Another thing that's been very strong at this conference is inclusion and participation, and it's a central theme of many presentations on different levels. So I feel a bit guilty summarising it here because it's it's a multi-layered issue, or they are multi-layered issues, but I've done my best here. But I think also, and I said, I said it yesterday during the ad hoc uh, microphone uh, thing I did, this is illustrated also by the breadth of people at this conference. It's it's It was a really diverse event, which I think is bears witness to what we're trying to achieve in the work we do globally but at least it's nice to see even in our meetings we are getting towards an element of true diversity which I think is is very strong and there are examples of things we should think about first of all tackling assumptions for example people too readily assume that 
people with intellectual disabilities aren't able to do things. They can, of course they can. We also need to involve young people, not as beneficiaries, but agents of change. And there's always, for a long time, there's been a big push to truly involve young people, not as a tick box event, but truly involving them. And I think it was also shared during this conference. We need to bring in research respondents as co-presenters of data about them. And I think that's been quite a strong theme underpinning some of the discussions because we did so much research on communities. We should take measures to involve them much more in planning the research and in feeding back the research, not just presenting on their behalf, but allowing them, bringing them in to present alongside uh, whoever has led on the research. We do know communities can be powerful and they have the power and agency to stop the spread of infectious disease and engaging the community is important for them to be resilient, according to Siobhan Walsh at Goal. But addressing power differentials is vital because communities are not just recipients, but participants in the response. And the, the notion that there has to there has to be an equality in the in the power structures, I think, has also been underpinning lots of discussions. The voice, of civil, the voice of civil society must be amplified. We need a strong relationship between governments and civil society with authentic representation of civil society, according to Mike Ryan this morning. And what about the term vulnerability? Uh, and Pamela Toledo yesterday said something that was really uh, hard hitting. It's not us who are vulnerable, but it's a situation makes us vulnerable. So we should be looking at structural things that disenfranchise people and make them less empowered rather than trying to help them be more empowered, if that makes more, if that makes sense, which I think was uh, was uh, was something that underpinned lots of things we we're talking about. So solutions dealing with the present and preparing for the future. Well, this was difficult to summarise because there's lots being done. Much is happening. And this is a very selective four items. Uh, well, there's five in the list. Uh, I, I just picked out as examples of, yes, actually things are being done. We have more information on cash transfers, uh, which has been really useful to see. We saw an example of how teaching mothers to monitor their children for malnutrition empowered them to detect malnutrition early and take action. Uh, we saw in Bulgaria professional developments uh, to address uh, Bulgarian kindergarten teachers' attitudes towards Roma children, Roma students. Those teachers who undertook the training had more positive attitudes, which is a great achievement. We also have new data on the accountability of external consultants and also much more, well, when I say much more, there isn't much already, so it's great to see it highlighted here uh, about unpaid health workers in Sierra Leone. We also learned that effective leaders are vital, and this afternoon was an amazing um, set of discussions about uh, women in leadership and Mary Kehoe of CBM said that one thing I've learned is the leader does not know all the answers. Leadership is about providing scaffolding to enable others, which includes of course community-owned leadership and gender equality and that refers back to what I was saying earlier about we need to address the power differential. But for interventions one size doesn't fit all and it's vital to hear from communities and engage with people rather than the organisations working with them to find things out and Sally Hayden was very powerful in everything she said last night but one of the things she said was interesting that we must listen to people who are most vulnerable and with direct experience talk to them what are they facing rather than trusting somebody else to tell us on their behalf we also heard this morning about the Lancet Commission and the, um, the climate change the world faces a critical juncture on climate change especially how to break away from the addiction to fossil fuels which are not not only about heating and light, but everything we buy. And this is going to be, we all know, of course, but it's going to be our role in the future to highlight and push this much more because this is the one big thing on the horizon that we know is coming and therefore uh, we can act on it. So there are many challenges in global health highlighted and answered achievements uh, during these two days, but we know a paradigm shift may be required to address these challenges and future challenges. So what are the key messages? And this is very selective, but these are the things that struck us. First of all, we do need to be more radical. We may be called naive, but it's those in denial who are actually truly naive. We also need to be furious, which I thought was great. I think it was Julian Eaton who said that from CBM about climate change. I think it was part of a conversation where he said there are two responses about the future. You can either give up in hopelessness or be angry. And of course, we should be furious and we must uh, increase individual community agency and protest to achieve change in climate uh, around climate change. Uh, 
But we can only make real progress through working with communities as equals and building on existing capacity and resources to ensure sustainability, because there are lots of resources within communities. How can we capitalise on those rather than forcing our own solutions onto them? It should be a partnership working together in order to achieve uh, improvements. Trust came up a lot as well during the two days, which clearly is the most important factor in working with communities. But there's also an urgency. We need to act fast. And I don't usually put quotes on take home messages, but I put this one in because Mike Ryan didn't say it. I don't think he said it these two days, but he has said it. We have to be fast. Have no regrets. If you need to be right before you move, you'll never win. So we have to move fast and we have to be at least trying to move things forward. And we only learn as we are moving forward because we will make mistakes. We always make mistakes, but we need to pick up the pieces and do better next time. We also know that civil society needs a much larger participatory space in decision making and policy development and how can we create that conduit in order to push civil society up much higher than they currently are in many sectors when it comes to decision making and we also know finally data we still need information we need more information from people uh, we need to hear what they're experiencing and this can be done through participatory research but then how can they be involved in generating change in partnership with people who work in global health how can we really move forward based on what we know from a, a research design perspective, but also what we know about their personal experiences and what they're actually facing in their day-to-day -day experience. I'd like to finish with a quote to reiterate uh, the radicalism. Robbie Lawler said this this morning. There were lots of things in that discussion we could have filled about 14 presentations about, but this struck me as interesting. We need to be more radical in global health, otherwise we will continue to fail because it, things seem to be accelerating. The crises seem to be coming along quicker. So we need to be adaptive. We need to be flexible and radical because otherwise we won't really achieve what we want to achieve at the end of the day. So that's all I've got to say. And again, apologies if it's missed anything out. There were lots and lots of important presentations during these two days, but these are just some of the highlights. So thank you for listening. And thanks to all the key correspondents for their fabulous inputs into the workshop, into the writing and into the discussions. So thank you.